dresser. And this is what I mentioned earlier. Ruth Ann supported the family by operating a dressmaking store while her eldest son worked a paper route. Um, and she thought that Jesse would have plenty to do to keep him out of trouble. That was what she thought when she, you know, petitioned for him to get out of prison. Just a month after his release is when he turned into a murderer. On March 18th of 70, 1874, nine-year-old Katie Curran went missing, and the last place she had been was the Pomeroy shop where Jesse now worked. Police talked to Jesse but discovered nothing. A month later, two brothers made a grisly discovery in a sandy ditch in Dorchester Bay. The naked body of four-year-old Horace Millen had his throat slit and was stabbed multiple times in the chest, groin, and even the eyes. Police were able to link the crime, the crime to a fourteen-year-old to fourteen-year-old Jesse, who was seen fleeing the scene by witnesses, and whose shoe prints matched those in the sand. He also had scratch marks on his body and blood on his clothing. That's pretty damning evidence, right? Upon Jesse's second arrest, Ruth Ann was forced to close her dressmaking shop. No one in South Boston wanted to patron. The Pomeroys, new owners, moved into the empty storefront in July where they uncovered the decomposing body of a child in the basement, and the remains were quickly identified as Katie Curran. The facts of the murder soon unraveled. Katie had come into the family shop to buy a notebook. Jesse lured her to the basement, attacked her from behind, and slit her throat. He then mutilated her body in much the same way he had brutalized Horace Millen's. Afterward, he buried her under a pile of ashes. And if you know anything about historical buildings, especially those in built in the 1800s, we have those in my hometown. We have all kinds. And the heating, um, the, usually there's a boiler or a coal stove or something in the basement, and you would have piles and piles of ashes from where you were, you know, burning fuel, depending on what that was. And so... In this, it wouldn't be unusual in this basement to have big piles of ashes. Um, so it's very smart to do that because under those ashes, that would mask the smell of her decomposing body quite for quite some time. So, I mean, obviously he got away with it until they sold the store. Um. Initially, Jesse confessed to the murder, saying that he couldn't help it. Later in life, he would amend his confession. In a rambling autobiography penned while incarcerated, Jesse alternately maintained his innocence and claimed insanity. In December of 1874, young Jesse Pomeroy was found guilty of first-degree murder. He was 14 years old. The judge initially sentenced him to death by hanging but Massachusetts Governor William Gaston refused to sign a warrant for his death on account of his age. Instead, Jesse spent the rest of his life in prison, part of it in solitary confinement, which began just shy of his 17th birthday in Charlestown State Prison. He died in the Bridgewater Hospital for the Criminally Insane at the age of 71 on September 29th of 1932. It's certainly he's under the category of serial killer because he killed two two children. Um, he is definitely one of the more disturbed youngsters that I've ever read about. And I understand as a mother that you would want your child to be released. You would want your child to you know, protect them as much as you can. But in this in this case, she had to know that he would be better off in prison or a mental institution. He had to have um, some sort of mental, you know, something incapacitating to be able to do these things. And of course, we we believe that it was the way he was raised by his father, him being bullied in school. All those things are just common threads that we talk about almost every time we talk about a serial killer. So for him to be that young, however, 
and turn that violent, that heinous. I almost feel like he also had to be born. Um, gosh, I, it's it's a hard thing to say, really, but I almost think he perhaps was born with that evil side to him. Um, I think he would definitely. There may be things we don't know about his childhood. Something bad, something horribly bad beyond being beaten by a drunken father had to happen for him to even understand or know about some of the things that he did to these children. You, This was a time, remember, when we didn't have, there was no social media, there was no television, there was, you didn't get the stories like you get them now. You can't just, he couldn't just go research. Now, of course, it did say that he was reading all these, um, I think the word they used was macabre tales, um, dime store novels. I don't know how gory they were. I don't know. That would be in, that would be the only way I think he would even understand that kind of thing unless he was treated similarly by his father. But again, we don't have reports of that. If it is the case that he, he was influenced by these books that he read when he was so young, that tells that tells us as a society how powerful a story words can be you know i enjoy reading because in my mind i envision the people in the book i envision where they're at i mean the whole story plays out in your mind as you're reading well imagine if you're reading these similar we're well, not similar but if you're reading all these books that are really horrible horrible things are in there and your mind is trying to picture what those look like how that could warp a mind that that is really um rapidly changing rapidly changing so there's several there's several different red flags with him that I don't, I don't know that you would have prevented any of this in school um, I do know, of course, they didn't have all the research on how bad bullying affects people. But here's a good example of that. There's no doubt in my mind that being bullied for his facial deformity contributed to his desire to hurt people and have control over them and control the situation. Um, and I have no doubt that his father contributed to his violent outbursts because obviously that's what he did to his children. He beat them. Um, and it's, you know, nothing, nothing new or, or exciting about that. I mean, we, I mean, as soon as I read it, I knew, but it's just, you think he did, um, he did all of this before he was 14 years old. I mean, at 14 years old, I wasn't even, I mean, I, we lived on a farm. I couldn't even watch a cow give birth. I couldn't watch them kill hogs. I could not stand blood and all that stuff. I couldn't do it. And you've got this young child who's able to, not only is he able to uh, be violent towards other people, bully them and humiliate them in very, you know, very sophisticated ways. He grows worse and worse as he gets older and eventually becomes a killer. And that's textbook. That's textbook. So there's our first young offender, the boy fiend of Boston. Now, the next one we'll talk about is Charlie Stark. Starkweather, Charlie Starkweather. And doesn't that sound like somebody from Game of Thrones? <laughs> the Starks, right? Um, he is known as a sadistic killer behind one of the most chilling murder sprees in American history. Uh, he was born in Nebraska. Okay. 
He was born in Nebraska, but he he was from a family of very average people. He was called a nobody. Um, so he wasn't from an affluent family. He wasn't from a family who made their mark anywhere. Um, sadly, he was um, just insignificant. I guess he felt insignificant. But in his death... He is, he's, of course, infamous, and he is remembered as the killer behind this horrible killing spree in America. He, as a matter of fact, inspired many movies like Badlands and Natural Born Killers. And then Bruce Springsteen wrote Nebraska about him and Quentin Tar- Tarantino's True Romance. Um, reflected on, they, they were influenced by his crimes. And Stephen King admits that he had a youthful obsession with Starkweather, who appeared in his books under numerous guises. So he was a muse, really, for all of these artists um, and authors, and has... You know, you you watch these things and you think about natural born killers and you think about Badlands and singing, you know, Nebraska. I I know all of these shows. I know the songs. And it's how disturbing it is to know that this these people were influenced by a real life just horrific human being. I mean, just unbelievable. He was born in Lincoln, Nebraska on November 24th of 1938. Charles Raymond Starkweather, known as Charlie, was a small town rebel typical of the area of the era. He identified with the silver screen defiance of James Dean, which if you know anything about James Dean, he was kind of like the rebel, um, rode the bike, black leather jacket, cool hair, good looking, but, you know, moody. As a teen, Stark Weather wore white t-shirts, jeans, and a biker jacket. It was just like James Dean. He combed his hair into a pompadour and even smoked his cigarettes like the Hollywood style, um, like the Hollywood star. But there were differences between the two, obviously. James Dean was an exceptional student. Stark Weather dropped out of high school. Uh, James Dean wasn't obsessed with guns, and he didn't exhibit increasingly psychopathic tendencies. And he didn't murder 11 people and kill two dogs because he could. But Starkweather did. Starkweather's first victim was gas station attendant Robert Colvert on November 30th of 1957. Colvert refused to sell him a stuffed toy for his girlfriend, Carol Ann Fugit. It enraged him. So Starkweather shot him before robbing the gas station and whatever cash he could find on Culvert's body. And that is known as his first murder that we know of, right? We all, we always, I think you always need that little disclaimer that this is the first one that we can pinpoint and attribute to him. Doesn't mean it's his first, but we're saying we know it's the first based on the information we have. Fugit's family was next. Her parents, Marion and Velma Bartlett, loathed Starkweather, only seeing trouble from him. They also disliked their 14-year-old daughter having a 19-year-old boyfriend, especially Lincoln's resident hooligan. Keep in mind, kids got married much younger in the early 1900s, late 1800s. We didn't have the rules of statutory rape. Um, It wasn't unusual to have 12, 13, 14-year-old girls dating and dating older guys, even young men. And I think a 19-year-old would be considered a young man. Um, On January 21st, 1958, after Marion and Velma Bartlett told Starkweather yet again to stay away. He shot them to death and then stabbed and strangled their two-year-old daughter, Betty June. Now, I know you know what I'm going to say. I can completely digest 